everyone, welcome back to the sixth lecture in the biotechnology series. Today, we are going to discuss RNA technology. The term RNA has been in the headline since late 2020, but in this lecture, we are not limiting our discussion to messenger RNA or mRNA, but also include one other form of RNA and its applications in biotechnology. So let's get started. In addition to messenger RNA, we are going to spend some time in discussing what RNA interference is, its history, and how it plays a role in organisms. To begin the talk, we are back to our molecular biology's central dogma again, but with a focus on RNA. Most people who have studied biology at an undergraduate level are familiar with the three types of RNA, namely messenger RNA, mRNA, ribosomal RNA, rRNA, and transfer RNA and tRNA. Now, however, there are a lot more different types of RNAs in cells that are not responsible for coding proteins. They are small nuclear RNA, microRNA, and heterogeneous nuclear RNA, and many more. Now, in this lecture, we will focus on small interfering RNA or siRNA and mRNA technologies. So what is RNA interference? RNA interference is a natural cellular process that can be harnessed to silence or knock down specific genes by shooting down the messenger RNA with small interfering RNAs. The purpose of RNA interference is to silence or knock down specific genes. The natural cellular process of RNA interference can be harnessed to selectively target and degrade unwanted messenger RNA molecules that encode for a specific gene in the cytoplasm. Essentially, it is a way for the cell to defend itself. Frequently, people say that groundbreaking discoveries emerge when experiments don't proceed as expected. This was undoubtedly the case with one of the initial sightings of RNA-mediated gene suppression. Initially, the group was working on the popular annual petunia hybrida, trying to deepen its coloration by increasing the number of copies of a gene encoding an enzyme that synthesizes the pigment. Now, to their surprise, not a single plant with a deepened coloration resulted from these experiments. Now, instead, many of the transformed flowers were completely white, and others produced streaks patterns containing more white regions than the original plants. This was the earliest observations of an RNA-modified gene silencing or suppression mechanism by Richard Jorgensen and colleagues at the DNA Plant Technology Corporation in Oakland, California. Now, it marked the beginning of a field of RNA interference, and it turned out that both the initial pigment gene and the introduced pigment genes were suppressed in their experiment. Co-suppression occurs via a mechanism known as post-transcriptional gene silencing, or PTGS, in which silenced genes are still actively transcribed, but the resulting messenger RNAs are degraded before they can be translated into proteins, leading to no or hypomorphic phenotypes, such as diminished purple color. The key here is that the presence of a few copies of double-stranded RNA and not just the antisense RNA interferes with the gene expression. The effect also affects other parts of the plant that are away from the site of introduction. It took almost a decade to identify the role of this form of RNA interference as a defense mechanism against plant viruses. 
。那 scientists Dr. Fire and Dr. Mellow later discovered RNA interference in C. elegans while attempting to use antisense RNA in a whole animal. Now, C. elegans is a small, free-living roundworm. Even though it is small, it is still an animal by definition. Now, they have shown that double-stranded RNA molecules can silence a gene by eliminating the messenger RNA corresponding to that gene. Their discovery awarded them the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. So let's have a quick recap of what you have listened so far. RNA interference is a type of gene regulation. It involves small RNA that is introduced by the presence of double-strand RNA molecules. The process can silence a gene by eliminating the messenger RNA corresponding to that gene. Now let's take a look at the process and how it actually happens. The big picture of RNA interference is that double-strand RNA is processed into shorter, small interfering RNAs that guide the targeted cutting, a piece of homologous RNA that is usually a messenger RNA. And to begin the process, let's take a deeper look. Double-strand RNA or dsRNA is introduced into the cell via some form of Mechanism either from an external source or by transcriptions of a double-strand RNA precursor. Now the double-strand RNA is cleaved or cut by an RNase enzyme called dicer into small interfering RNAs or siRNAs with both sense and antisense strands, meaning the forward and the reverse strand. Now these small RNAs are typically between 21 to 25 nucleotides in length, with two to three nucleotide overhangs, as shown in the figure here. One strand of the siRNA duplex is then loaded onto the RNA-induced silencing complex, commonly abbreviated as RICE, which consists of an Argonaut protein and other accessory proteins. Then the double-stranded siRNA is then unwind. The antisense siRNA acts as a guide for rice, and the rice complex binds to the target messenger molecule that has a complementary base pairing with the siRNA. And finally, the target messenger RNA is cut by the organoid protein, leading to its degradation and/or translational repression. RNA interference is a powerful tool for genetic research, and has several advantages over traditional methods of gene knockdown or knockout. Now, first, it is selectively targeting. RNA interference allows for selective targeting of specific genes or transcripts, making it possible to study the function and regulation of individual genes in complex biological systems. Second, it is fast and efficient.、Uh, this technology or this method can lead to rapid and efficient knockdown of gene expression, often within hours of introducing the small RNA molecules. Now, it is also reversible.、Uh, this process is a reversible process, making it possible to restore gene expression by removing or inhibiting the small RNA molecules. And lastly,、uh, this can also have systemic effects, allowing the study of the gene function and regulation in whole organisms of tissue because of the conserved endogenous machinery. RNA interference has a wide range of potential applications in basic research, biotechnology, and medicine. For example, if a disease has an overexpression of a certain protein, RNA interference can knock down the messenger RNA and so to decrease the protein expression. 
and for plants, RNA interference can be used to engineer new plant metabolic pathways with fine control of protein expression. This may lead to increased agricultural value of fruits, such as making them to ripen earlier and with a shorter growing time. But why do plants and animals have this RNA interference machinery in place? In addition to RNA interference gene regulation, it can be a cellular mechanism to defend against foreign DNA and RNA. RNA interference can target and degrade viral RNA, providing a defense mechanism against viral infections. It can also silence the expression of transposable elements, such as DNA sequences that can move around the genome and potentially cause mutation or genome instability. And lastly, RNA interference plays a critical role in regulating developmental processes, such as cell differentiation and patterning by controlling the expression of key genes. Here are some of the takeaway key points from this first part of the lecture. RNA interference is a valuable research tool both in cell culture and in living organisms. The most widely held view is that RNA interference evolved to protect the genome virus. Now, among all approaches to genetic modifying plants, RNA interference shows a greater potential for crop improvement and sustaining production and productivity. Now, let's wrap up this lecture with a very brief talk on messenger RNA technology, which is a term that most people have heard and experienced since 2020. Now, I know this is a rapidly evolving field, and here I'm only presenting a snapshot of the established knowledge from a technical standpoint. The idea of using messenger RNA as therapeutics is not as new as a lot of people believe. Now, in the early 1990s, researchers discovered that messenger RNA could be used to produce proteins in cells outside of the body. However, it was challenging to get the messenger RNA to enter cells inside the body where it could be used to produce proteins. Now, in in the early 2000s, scientists began to explore ways to overcome this problem. They discovered that by modifying the messenger RNA molecule, they could increase its stability and enable it to enter cells more easily. They also found that by incorporating nucleoside modifications, they could reduce the immune response that was often triggered by messenger RNA. Now, simultaneously, different teams of scientists were looking for ways to deliver messenger RNA into cells. Among all of the tested RNA delivery platforms, lipid nanoparticles are the most versatile. Now, lipid nanoparticles are small spherical particles composed of a lipid bilayer that surrounds and protects the messenger RNA molecule. The lipid bilayer is made up of a mixture of phospholipids, cholesterols, and aminolipids, which are chosen based on their ability to form stable and biocompatible nanoparticles. The messenger RNA is encapsulated inside the lipid nanoparticle, which protects it from degradation and helps it to enter cells. The lipid nanoparticle can bind to cell membranes and fuse with them, allowing the messenger RNA to enter the cytoplasm of the cell, where it can be translated into the desired protein. After the messenger RNA enters the cytoplasm of the cell and gets translated into proteins, the fate of that protein will depend on its origin. If the protein is native and recognized as a self-protein, it can perform its function as intended. However, if the translated protein is non-self, such as from pathogens and cancers, 
it will get broken down into peptide pieces and presented via the MHC class 1 molecule. Now, subsequently, initiate adaptive immune responses with the mechanism we talked about in the immunology series lecture 6. So, if you need a refresh on that concept, please check that out. Another potential use of messenger RNA-based therapeutics is as a preventative treatment for recent exposure to viruses. Now, in this case, the messenger RNA will code for a therapeutic protein such as a monoclonal antibody instead of a non-self antigens. This way of delivery may have the potential to replace the direct infusion of therapeutic antibodies. This technology is in the clinical phase of development. Let's have a conclusion of this week's topic. This week, we explored CRISPR technology and how it used guide RNA to protect bacteria from invading bacteriophage genomic materials. It almost acts as the adaptive immune system for the bacteria. We have also discussed how RNA interference works to remove invading double-stranded genomic material. Both of these play a huge role in biotechnology applications, where the ultimate goal is to alter protein expressions in a cell or an organism through genomic regulations. And with mRNA technology, the ability to produce therapeutic proteins could have the potential to change the landscape of monoclonal antibody therapies as we know it. Now, when therapeutic proteins such as MAB are produced inside our body or our cells, the cost of the therapy would be much, much lower than the current standard method of antibody production. Messenger RNA synthesis is also an in vitro chemical process with no batch to batch variation. It is also relatively easy to change the messenger RNA sequence to adapt to new proteins. Now, however, like all newer technology, there is limited clinical experience. As I said earlier, the technology is evolving with new research articles being published every day in this field. So there may be new discovery of risk and hurdles, such as off-target effects, low efficacy, long-term safety in human, and the development of anti-pigulation antibodies. Now, for future reference, this information will get updated as time goes by. While we are on the RNA subject, they seem to have a lot more biological role than we previously thought. Some RNA also has enzymatic activities, and we call them ribozymes. Now that brings us to the question if the central dogma has always been true since the beginning of life as we know it on Earth. So, coming up next in the biotechnology series, we will explore topics related to ligand evolution and see how this methodology leads to the important discovery of therapeutic proteins and as well as allowing me to get my PhD. So stay tuned and I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.